I hope you find your joy in Jesus Christ. This world is not our home. The Bible refers to us as strangers. The pilgrims were just simply passing through. We find no lasting help here in this life. It's in eternity to which we look. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts, please. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We're going to begin with in the 23rd verse of that chapter. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Acts 24, verse 23. The Bible says, And when they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is thou who didst make the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, thy servant, did say, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples divide, devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, in this city they were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all confidence, while thou didst extend thy hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of thy holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for this wonderful text of Scripture as we, we turn to this mighty, mighty prayer we see, Lord God, you challenging us this morning to speak the word boldly. To be the type of church, Lord God, that prioritizes you over the things of this world. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we peer into the riches of this text, that you would again speak to us this day and teach us we pray in Jesus name amen you may be seated here in this text we come to the conclusion of the first encounter with government authorities that the church experiences. Our text here this morning says that Peter and John went to their own. This trial was a result of the healing of the lame man and 
And after the trial was over, it was clear that the government was firmly entrenched against the church. The disciples, Peter and John, reconnected with their own, with the divine community. And this reconnection, uh, I believe, serves as a revelation of what is true of every genuine believer. Their family, their, their real relationships, their, their most intimate connections are found within the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Why, why, is, why are our, our most intimate connections found here? Because Christianity, and more importantly, Christ, has come to define who we are. Not the world, not human relationships, not earthly affiliations. Christ defines who we are. As Paul so wonderfully put it, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Here in this text, we saw last week that only certain Jews were their own, while all other Jews were not their own. The priority of the people of God to the true Christian. Once reconnected, we also saw last week that they all united around prayer. Prayer in which they took their situation before God. Although one person was praying for them, they were all praying in unison with that one person. And who were they praying to? They were praying, as we saw last week, to the dispot. The dispot. The absolute owner and controller and uncontrolled power of the world and everything in it. Including them. You see... They were praying to him because it was to him that they were ultimately accountable, not the government. <laughs> and so they prayed to the despot, the one who controls everything, the one who's over everything, the one whose power is unresisted in the world. In their prayer last week, we saw them appeal to, to Psalm 2, Psalm 2. A psalm designed as a reminder to the children of Israel that try as they might, the peoples, the nations, and the governments of men could not stop or thwart Israel's king, God's king, from being seated on his throne and extending God's will. Psalm 2 is very, very clear. The nations are raging. The governments of men are seeking to overthrow Israel, but God says, I'm on the throne. <laughs> you will not be overthrown. It doesn't matter that they're gathering against you, surrounding this, this little nation. God says, I got you. <laughs> this psalm is a powerful psalm. Although the nations threatened, their threats accounted for nothing before God. Mm. Having identified the type, the type by which they viewed their situation, Luke will next record that aspect of their prayer that identifies how they fulfilled that type. Follow, follow what's going on here, church. Make sure you understand the Bible. The church is praying, and in their prayer, they go right back to Psalm 2. And in that second psalm, they quote the first two verses of that song about the nations raging, about the nations taking their stand, about the nations gathering against who? Against his anointed. His anointed. Who's his anointed? In the psalm, his anointed is the king of Israel. But his anointed came to also refer to the Messiah. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me let, let, follow, follow the prayer of the early church. They move from type to fulfillment. Look at verses 27 and 28. For truly in this city. Now, Psalm 2 is talking about way, way back then. Okay? That's Psalm 2. 
But look what they do now. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. Here we see exactly the thoughts of the people of God. Notice the four that begins this next sentence. Here we will express, explicitly see why this psalm was chosen and we'll also see a vast adjustment made to this psalm. There's a reason that whoever was praying at this time prayed Psalm 2. Do you know why he prayed Psalm 2? It's important, it's critical. He's praying, he's lifting, he's lifting up the uh, church. John and Peter have just come back from the government wanting to shut them down. And they begin to pray and their minds go directly to the second song. Why? Without, remember, without question, in its historical context, this psalm would have been understood to be a direct reference to the Gentile nations uniting against each, uniting with each other against the nation of Israel and its king. God was working on the behalf of his people while the nations surrounding Israel were attempting to bring his work in Israel to an end. But something happened to these believers in the first century. Jesus was rejected. And not just by Gentiles. You know who was right in the middle of his rejection? Israel. His own people. He came to his own. And his own what? Embraced him? Accepted him? Did his own receive him? His own rejected him. That completely changed their worldview. Completely. Let's look at this. First, the interpretive key to this whole, to this whole prayer. Hmm. Here in verse 27, we read at the beginning of the verse, for truly in this city, they were gathered together. Don't miss that. The word for here is followed by the word truly. The word truly means for truth, for truth. So literally he's praying for, for truth. Well, that doesn't make sense. What does for, for truth mean? This, this phrase for truth is, 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 is trying to put an emphasis on the link between the psalm and the situation right now. He's, he's, he's saying there really is a tie here. In his prayer, we see the reasoning of the early church. This is how they thought. This is how believers at that time were thinking. And he, he looked at Psalm 2 in his prayer, and he looked at their situation, and he made a direct connection and tie. For, for, for truth. Now, the emphasis in this statement is we're gathered together. That is the interpretive key of this whole prayer. In Psalm 2, the nations were gathered together. Just read the psalm. The nations are gathered. All the nations around Israel are gathered together against Israel. So the early church asked themselves this question. Who was gathered here against Jesus? After all, Jesus is the Messiah, is he not? Yeah. Follow their reason, follow their logic. In Psalm 2, the nations are gathered together against his anointed, God's anointed, the King of Israel. Who was gathered here against Jesus? And it wasn't just the Gentiles. Follow, follow, follow them in their thinking as they're praying to God. They're thinking about how they relate to the situations in salvation history. Psalm 2, the salvation history. What's happened before? 
Jesus is the anointed. So what's happening now? People are gathered against Jesus. In fact, watch this. The same people who are gathering now against Jesus are the same people telling us to be, to be quiet. Same group. The same group that gathered to, to stop Jesus, to kill Jesus, is the same group now telling us as a church that we can't teach on Jesus. Same people. Look at the fulfillment here in Jesus next. This description of Jesus is really unusual. Whoever was praying at this time prayed in this way, thy holy servant Jesus whom thou didst anoint. Thy holy servant Jesus whom thou didst anoint. You should, notice, you should notice a couple of links here between the prayer and the psalm. Uh, last week, I talked about the implications of this prayer. Well, it's, it's clear that the implications were actually true, okay? What we said by implication last week is clearly the case this week because his anointed, as far as the church is concerned, is Jesus. In in the psalm, the psalm was about his anointed. Who is the his anointed? As far as the church is concerned, the his anointed is Jesus Christ. They, they identify the anointed as specifically being Jesus. Now, take, take note of a, a few things here with, with me. First off, in the sermon in Acts chapter 3, remember, Acts 4 is built on Acts 3. They healed the lame man. They taught on the resurrection. They were arrested at the beginning of, of, of chapter 4, went through a trial. They were released, and now they're praying. So Acts 3 is in the mind of the men who are here praying at this time. And in Acts 3, in the sermon in Acts 3, Peter refers to Christ as the holy and righteous one. We saw that in Acts 3, verse 14. And I argued that that's messianic. That phraseology, I mean, Peter's being very clear here. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Holy One. He's the Righteous One. And notice how he picks up the same, whoever's praying, whoever's praying picks up the same idea in the prayer. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Holy One. He's the Holy Servant. Servant. Now, notice in your text, who else did he call servant in verse 25? David. He referred to David as thy servant. Then he comes back now and refers to Jesus as thy servant. Here we have, watch this, here we have a son of David, a latter son of David, who himself was also referred to as God's servant, just as David was. Now, David was anointed, right? Who was he anointed by? Samuel, right? Samuel came in with the special flask of oil. He went through all of David's other older brothers, and, 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 and Samuel said, surely, I mean, he, I mean, Samuel knew for sure one of his older brothers was, was going to be king. God said, ah, no, 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 no. There's one more out in the field tending the flock. He's the nobody brother. God took the nobody brother and anointed him as king. Oh my gosh. Look what God does, right? So he's anointed by Samuel. But watch this. Who anoints this servant in Acts 4? God anointed him. Wasn't no servant of God. Wasn't no human being anointed Jesus. He was anointed specifically by God, indicating he was ordained and chosen to be king by God himself, and God anointed him. Now, when did God anoint him? Who descended on him? The Holy Spirit. When? At his baptism. At his baptism. He received a special anointing. So, this isn't just any old servant here, church. Unlike any other descendant 
of David. This descendant of David, Jesus Christ, was ordained to be the Messiah, to be the servant of God by God himself and anointed by God himself. God carried out his anointing himself. It's fulfillment in Jesus. And look at how this psalm is fulfilled in men. The church came to realize that Psalm 2 was an ultimate reference to Jesus. So to understand the ultimate meaning of this psalm, one must identify exactly who gathered to oppose him. Who gathered to oppose the king? The church identified two people, Herod and Pontius Pilate. Herod and Pontius Pilate. Now, Luke, watch this, Luke is the only gospel writer who mentions Herod's role in the death of Jesus. He's the only one. Matthew doesn't, Mark doesn't, John doesn't. Luke is the only one who mentions that Herod was in this thing up to his elbows. In Luke 23, 8 through 12. So it's no surprise that now in Acts, who does Luke refer to? Not just to Pontius Pilate. He also refers to Herod. But watch this. Who were Herod and, and Pilate? They were official representatives. As far as Rome was concerned, Herod was the direct representative of the Jewish people. As far as the Roman Empire was concerned, Pilate was the governor of the region and therefore the representative of the Roman Empire. So what do you have here? You have the representative of the Jews and the representative of the Gentiles gathered against Jesus. But you know what? Both of those guys represent somebody. Herod represents Israel. Pilate represents the, the Gentiles. So it wasn't just the leadership gathered against Jesus. Who else was gathered against Jesus? The nations, everybody. The, the Gentile nations and shock of all shocks, Israel. Israel. Herod and Israel, Pilate and the Gentiles gathered together against Jesus. Wow. Wow. Church, this is an earthquake in salvation history. This is a complete turning on his head of salvation history. What the early church believed is that Israel was as culpable as the nations for the death of the Messiah. They gathered against their own king. It was a mutiny. Rather than being led by their king, the holy and anointed servant of God, the Messiah, they, in the greatest sign of rebellion and sin in Israel's history, rose up with the nations to act against their Messiah and what God was doing through him. Wow. Wow. But you know what, church? Peter had already said this to the Sanhedrin. This is back in his sermon. What did he, what did he say in his sermon? He, he referred to the religious leaders as the builders who rejected the stone. And remember what we learned, that, that reference, that Old Testament reference, the builders were the Gentiles. The stone was Israel and its leadership. So the builders in the Old Testament were the Gentile nations who rejected Israel and its leadership. But as far as Peter was concerned, all y'all are builders. When, when you don't submit to Jesus, you're taking up sides.
If you're on Jesus' side, you're on our side. If you wave in Jesus' flag, that's my flag. End of story. There is, there, is, there is no human relationship or no human affiliation that trumps that flag. If you're waving that, you're waving my flag. Peter said, by the mere fact that you're standing against Jesus, you're taking up sides. You are as good as being a Gentile. That's a huge, I mean, that's, I mean, we, we don't, we don't, we don't know how, what, how huge a statement that was. Peter in the midst of the Sanhedrin is saying, you all are simply physical descendants of Abraham. You're not spiritual descendants of Abraham. Peter got that from somewhere. He didn't make it up himself. You know where he got that from? Jesus. Because in Mark chapter 13, we saw Jesus do the same thing. Jesus quotes the same verse that Peter will quote, and he says, the builders are now the, the Jewish people standing against me. Watch this, church. This is why <laughs> the early church devoted itself to the apostles' teaching. They're the conduit. Do you want to know what Jesus meant by what he taught? Go to the apostles. The apostles are the one, ones that bring the teaching of Jesus Christ to the church. You have to obey the apostles. This is critical. It's so important for our day and age. I'm tired of hearing people who call themselves evangelicals who say, I follow the teaching of Jesus. I'm not really into the apostles. You know who says it all the time? <laughs> people who advocate for women elders and women pastors. They do this all the time. Well, I, I, go with, I go with what Jesus says. I don't really, I don't really follow what Paul, you know, Paul is kind of doing his own thing. I'm following Jesus. The conduit of Jesus' teaching is the apostles. If, if you're not following them, guess what? You're not following Jesus. I don't care, I don't care how, how godly you look or how spirit, I mean... I was watching the news and heard Billy Graham's daughter say that she, she her, her ministry was guided by Jesus and not the apostles. You know why? Because Jesus told Mary to go tell his brethren to meet him in Galilee. And that for her, that proved that Jesus has a place for women teaching and exercising authority over men. She just got on national TV as a spokesman for the church and told the whole world, don't obey the Bible. Don't obey the Bible. Who cares what Paul said? He ain't nobody. It's clear here, church. It's clear in this text. Peter is not making this stuff up on the fly. The, the, uh, the apostles of Jesus Christ are the conduits through which we gain an understanding of what Jesus said and did and its meaning. What's the significance of Jesus? What's the significance of what he said? What's the significance of what he did? The apostles tell us that. And that's why it's so important that we give ear to them. We give heed to what they say. As the early church in Acts 2.42, we are completely committed to the apostles' teaching. But they're not finished praying yet. 
Look at the fulfillment by God. There is more that must be answered here regarding these events. I, I noted that, that there has been an escalation of the meaning of this psalm due to the fact that in its original context, it referred to the Gentile nations and not, and not the nation of Israel. But now we see it, it refers to both the nation and the nations. Well, here's my question. <laughs> Was God jury rigging history? Was God jury rigging history? Was God trying to, trying to fit in something he didn't anticipate? God had this plan revealed in Psalm 2 where it would be the nations, but he didn't, he didn't know that Israel was going to lose its mind and join with the nations. And so now God is having to come up with a way to fix it. And so how he fixes it is he said, oh, what the psalm really means is, the, is Jews and Gentiles. God is jury rigging history. The church didn't believe that. Let me, let me tell you what the church believed based on this prayer. Verse 27. To do <laughs> whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. All this stuff going on here, all of this shift and this escalation of meaning is in the plan of God. <laughs> first, first, let's be clear here, church. This gathering was to do. Don't miss the to do. In other words, there was a real intention within the individuals acting. What am I getting at? Well, sometimes in the church, when we think about the sovereignty of God, we think about little more than the secular idea of determination. We don't believe in determination. The idea that people don't make any decisions, the idea that people don't have wills, and the idea that people don't make choices. We don't believe that. We don't believe in, in hard determination as taught by human philosophy. It's not Christian. We do believe in the human capacity to act and to act without a sense of coercion. We believe that. What does the book of Proverbs remind us? The mind of man does what? Plans his way. But the Lord directs his steps. Proverbs 16, 19. A little later, the Bible says, the lot is cast into the lap. We believe that. But we also believe that its very decision is from the Lord. Proverbs 16, 33. Human action and thus human accountability and responsibility is a real thing. Yet it is a reality within the broader truth of the sovereign direction and decrees of God. And it is this aspect of human actions that was the focus of the church in, the, in this prayer. What our translation has translated as to do whatever literally referred out of the idea of to do as much as. To do as much as. It basically referred to the idea of quantity, size, or number. I like the idea of how much could be done. They gathered to do how much could be done. I don't, you don't understand what I'm saying. God, listen, was sovereignly placing limits on the actions that they had determined to execute against Jesus. 
God was putting limits on it by his sovereign will. Church, you should be happy about that. Do you understand that God controls the events of your life? He puts sovereign limits on what we go through. Now, some of you may not be going through stuff. I'm going through stuff right now. I'm thankful that the stuff I'm going through, God puts limits on it. And whatever he determines to happen, that's good for me. I don't understand it. Plenty of times I'm confused. Plenty of times I don't even know how to pray. But my Bible says the Spirit prays on my behalf. Even when I'm confused, I don't know what to pray up or down. But the Holy Spirit knows exactly what I need. And he intercedes on my behalf. That's what my Bible tells me. They gathered. Oh, yeah, they gathered. To do what they wanted to do. But you know what? God himself was there organizing and supervising and superintending what took place. Hmm. Oh, they wanted to gang up on Jesus and do all that they wanted to do. God, however, was exercising his will at that time. It was not just simply man gathering and determining to act. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Thank God it's not just about people deciding what's going to happen to you. People gathering together and saying, we're going to take her out. We're tired of him. We're we're tired of his attitude. Aren't you glad it's not just about what the people can do against you? (laughs) Thank God. It was not just simply man gathering and determining to act. God has his intentions. Things had to be done for his plan to come to pass. This is described as being found in God's hand and purpose. Being found in God's hand. Listen to the prayer to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. I'm so thankful for the hand of God. From the exodus through the time of the kings, God's power and purposes were linked to his hand. This was because it was through a person's hand that they acted or carried out certain actions. Deuteronomy 5 verse 15 is prototypical in this, in this regard when it says, and you shall... Remember that you were you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty what hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. God has an God has a hand and an arm so powerful that it can accomplish whatever he determines for it to accomplish. Thank God for his hand and his outstretched arm. (laughs) Here, here within this statement and the prayer of the early church, we gain a clear picture of how the early church viewed the events surrounding Jesus' death. They held human beings really accountable for what took place. It was their fault that Jesus died, and they should be and will be held accountable for killing him. That is true. In this sense, their actions were prototypical of all human beings, you and me, and our guilt for Jesus. We can point our finger at them all day long, but you know what? You're just as guilty. You killed Jesus. You were there asking for him to be hung on a cross. You're just, you stand just as guilty today as they stood. Thank God that Jesus saved you. (laughs) 
Thank God that he didn't leave you in your state and condition. So although they're guilty, on the other hand, God was actually and really in control. This is the, this is the thing. <laughs> what did Jesus pray in the garden? He wanted this cup to pass. But then he said, nevertheless, what Herod and Pontius Pilate won't do that. Is that what he prayed? Did he pray for the will of Herod and Pontius Pilate to be done? I thought human beings determined what happened. What he prayed was, he prayed that your will be done. And so, although they were moving to do what they wanted to do, it's very, very clear, the Father's will was done that day. God intended, God intended these events to take place because he had a specific purpose that he was seeking to accomplish. And notice what they said in their prayer. Look at this text. What thy hand and thy purpose predestined, predestined to occur. You see, church, the death of Christ is more than a sovereign God taking, taking the lemons given to him in life and making lemonade from them. It's more than just that. You know, it's, 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 more, it's more than God making, making the best out of a difficult situation. The church believed that this was, in fact, the design of God. <laughs> the design of God. What does the word predestined mean? It means to decide upon, to determine, to come to a decision beforehand. Although not used often in the New Testament, we are familiar with this word, and it's used by God to describe salvation. Normally, normally we see this, this, this word in salvation context, where God is predestining, predestinating us to salvation. When did this happen? Before the creations of the world, <laughs> right? So that's where we're using, for example, let me give you an example, Romans 8, 29 through 30. We're used to it in that context. What does Paul say there? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Predestination is the beginning of an inalterable sequence of events that will lead, hallelujah, to your glorification. The, 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 these events can't be undone. These events can't be stopped. Once you're predestinated, it's a done deal. You're going to be glorified. <laughs> this is the work of God. Amen. However, this was more than a descriptive term of how God brings salvation about. The early church believed this is how God worked, period. All his works. You see, church, God is not simply a powerful being reacting to the free decisions of men. <laughs> God is actually a sovereign king executing his will in time. Those are two different things. God is not just simply a real powerful, powerful person who gave men, quote unquote, free will and, is only, and all he's doing is kind of reacting to what we do. He's up there kind of dodging our decisions and, 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 and really trying to make sense of all that's going on. You know, oh, oh this is happening over here. So God runs over here. Oh, a fire over here. God runs over there. The fire. And, 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 and all God is doing is reacting, reacting, reacting to our mess. <laughs> Here's what the early church believed. That fire, God started the fire. That problem, that's God's problem. God's in control of all of it. Either God 
efficaciously brings it about or God permissively allows it. But either way, I can trust him in it because he's in control. <laughs> That's our God. That's our God. That's what the early church believed. Do you want to believe the same way they believe? You'll believe the same thing. Church, God is not seeing what will happen in the future and then including what he sees in his plan. God is carrying out the blueprint established before the foundations of the world. <laughs> Keep your finger here and turn to Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. <laughs> now, here's just one little tiny piece of his plan. God had determined to raise up a king named Darius. Now, Darius wasn't born yet, yeah. but hundreds of years before his birth, yes. God prophesies of his coming and gives his name. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Before he's born, his name appears in the Bible. Yes. Okay. Now, God is explaining how he can do this to his people. <laughs> All right? Watch what he says, Isaiah 46, beginning in verse 8. This is God talking. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. What do you like, God? Can you explain it to us? Okay. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a, from a far country. Truly I have spoken it. Truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. God says, look, it's in my plan. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. It's going to happen. This is how I function and how I operate. This is, this is, I don't know about you, this is comforting to the believer. Yes. I am so happy today that the fires going on in my life have not caught God off guard. Off balance. He, 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 he doesn't know, know what to do. He knows that person who said that they were your best friend and you found was talking behind your back. You, 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 you think that surprised God? That coworker trying to stab you in the back and take you out as you lose your job. Do you think that surprises God? That he's shocked? These things in our life that take place, these are not accidents. They're sovereign occurrences or sovereign allowances. And our God is still in control. I, I still remember the words of Elder D.J. Ward, a pastor I met late in, my, late in his life. He passed away just a few years after I met him. Had a wonderful influence on my life. As he died of cancer, he said he made this statement. We say God is sovereign. He's going to make us believe it. He's he going to put you in a situation where all you got is the sovereignty of God. Yes. That's all you got. you got. You got nothing else. You got, you, nobody can help your situation. Nobody can intervene and do a thing about what you're going through. You're at the hands of human history, so you think, but really, you're in the hands of God. <laughs> He's got you, saint. Yeah. He's got you. And I'm preaching to myself this morning. He's got you. He's got you. Come on. 
it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the circumstances of life are. He's got you. Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, God said. Surely I will do it. In this prayer of the church, we see how they understood God. But, but why was this so important to their prayer? Remember church, what gave birth to this prayer? What is, it, what is it that gave birth to this prayer? It was the opposition of the government to the revealed will of God to them. The threat that they were under if they continued to do what the Lord had said was real. It was a, this was a real threat. They had threatened them. How did the church deal with the threats of the world? They appealed to the sovereign God. God is in control. God has called me to act in a way that might endanger my life. Listen to how they're praying. God has asked me, this is how they're praying, to act in such a way that it might endanger my life. How should I therefore act? Should I act to safeguard my safety or should I act to do the will of God? I should act to do the will of God. How do you do that? How does a person act when they know that their action might cause them problems? You have to depend on the sovereignty of God. Amen. Where else can you go? I can't go to people. As much as I know that you love me, look, I, I, I know that when push comes to shove, all I have ultimately in this world is the sovereign promise of God. Amen. And that's who the church turned to. They turned to God. We finally arrive at their request. <laughs> they came to God as the despot of the world and the sovereign king, whose plan it was to have Jesus sacrificed at the hands of those who were trying to stop them as well. And what do they request from God? Look at their request this morning. <clears throat> Verse 29 and 30. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all confidence while thou dost extend thy hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of thy holy servant, Jesus. I have to admit, church, that as I read these words, my mind went immediately, immediately to Psalm, to uh, Isaiah 37. Keep your finger and turn to Isaiah with me. I mean, it went right there. In, in Isaiah chapter 37, Jerusalem was surrounded by the Assyrian military. This, this was the strongest and, and most vicious fighting force in this era of time. And Sennacherib, he was the leader of, 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 uh, of Assyria, had invaded this region in Isaiah chapter 36. He had hemmed in Hezekiah, the king of Israel, in Jerusalem. And, and he sent his messenger, Rab, Rabshakeh, to, to Hezekiah, in Jerusalem to negotiate Hezekiah's surrender. Hezekiah inquires of God through the prophet Isaiah as, as, as to what was going to happen in Isaiah 37. I, Isaiah reassured him that God was going to get rid of both the king and safeguard his people. Now, what began to happen is the army of, of uh, the army of Assyria became unsettled. 
Rabshakeh has to go help his king, but Rabshakeh sends a messenger with a letter to Hezekiah. This is verses 8 through 13. Hezekiah then does one of the greatest acts of faith, I believe, in all the Bible. Hezekiah takes the letter that Rabshakeh has written. Okay? He takes it before God. Let's pick up what happens in, in Isaiah 37, verse 14. Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it, and he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. He spread out that, that letter. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, O the, the God of Israel, who art enthroned above the cherubim, thou art the God, thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear, open thy eyes, O Lord, and see, and listen to all the words of Sennacherib, who sent them to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated all the countries and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but were the work of man's hands, wood and stone. So they have destroyed them. And now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from the hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou alone, Lord, art God. And what was God's response? After God sent word to Hezekiah through Isaiah in, 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 in 21 through 35, we then read in verse 36, <laughs> then the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men arose early in the morning, behold, all these were dead. <laughs> only one God. Yeah. There's only one God. Yes. And guess what? Yeah. He's on our side. <laughs> He's our God. He's our God. Has Hezekiah went to the temple and opened up and said, God, do you see this? Yes, sir. Do you see this? Will you act on what you see? And what does the church pray? And now, Lord, take note of their threats. <laughs> God, you, you see what they're doing to us, don't you? God, you see what's happening down here, don't you? These men, this, this government is trying to stop us from doing the will of God. Don't let them succeed. <laughs> First here, notice the need for boldness. The need for boldness. They were asking God to look on the threats. The only other occurrence of this term is found in Luke 1, 25, as Elizabeth used it to describe God acting upon her behalf as God looked upon her. The concern of the speaker here is not just for God to notice, but the implication here is for, is for God to act. They want God to act. Mm. Church, I said, this, I said this last week, but what the church wants is not what we suspect that they wanted. When you read a text like this, what you expect is for the person praying to ask God to destroy those resisting his plan. What you expect is, God, take these fools out. That's what they prayed in the Old Testament, right? Break the teeth of our enemies. Split, the, split their heads wide open. I mean, in, 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 the, in the Old Testament, they prayed for the demise of the enemies of God. Those who stood against God's people. God Kill them. The government was clearly against the will of God. They were clearly enemies of God. Praying for their demise would make sense. But this was not what the church prayed for. They didn't pray for the government to be taken out. 
they, they, didn't even, they did not even pray for the members of the government to be saved. The church had very little concern over what the government might or might not do to them. I like what Dr. Bach says about this, this text. And I quote, the community leaves to God the moral judgment of the opponents and their actions. It does not pray explicitly for the opponents to be crushed, nor does it seek to be spared opposition. It asks to face the opposition and suffering faithfully, end quote. They don't ask, oh God, please don't make me suffer. Please don't make anything bad happen to me. That's not their prayer. Their prayer is, God, when bad stuff happens, let me be faithful. When stuff goes crazy, help me to do what you've called me to do. What do we expect is going to happen in this world? This world is not our home. Crazy stuff going to happen down here. What are you supposed to do? Be faithful. Here is the thing that we have to understand, church. This is not going to be popular, but if our compliance to God's intentions for the church hinge upon a lack of opposition from our earthly government, then our compliance will always be in limbo until God makes it, until God makes it safe to be a Christian. This is what I see in some, not all, so don't walk out of here saying, Pastor said everybody. This is what I see in some believers who are determining their involvement with the things of the Lord based on what happens or doesn't happen with COVID. Listen, if complying with God's will must be preceded with the approval or allowance of men or guaranteed safety, you can be sure that there will, there will always be a reason to not comply. Amen. Always. <laughs> I heard a sermon this week from one of my best buddies in ministry, Pastor Jackson. He was preaching on numbers. 25, uh, and, and, and the incident of the, of the, of the 10 spies that, that, that came back. <laughs> 10 spies came back, and although they gave a bad report, they gave a right report. The people in the land were strong. It, it was going to be dangerous going in the land. They were giants in there. Don't kid yourself. Some of the walls, he said, were 25 feet thick. It was going to be a problem going into the promised land. But, some, but two of the spies who saw the same problem saw God. And God was bigger than the reality of the problems. The problems were real. The danger was real. The issues were real. But God was more real than the problems were. Don't let, me, don't let me preach his sermon. Don't let me preach his sermon. If you're waiting for it to be okay, you're going to be waiting a long time. Once, listen, once your limit is ascertained, be sure that you will continue to bump up against that limit. Be sure of it. There's stuff that's going to come into your life that's going to keep you bumping up against that limit. No wonder. No wonder these men prayed and grant that thy bondservants 
may speak thy word with all confidence. They didn't pray, they didn't pray for safety. These folk, listen, they were threatened. Do this again and see what happens. And the people doing it had the power to make it happen. The Sanhedrin said, do, do, this, do this again. Go ahead, do it if you want. But you're going to be toast. And what are they praying? God help us do it. What? Grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all confidence. Notice the request here for boldness. The assumption of this request is that the, is that the world was not going to be, is not, was not going to ease up on them. Clearly, they are asking for help. Listen, clearly, they're asking for help to act independent of the forces that will array against them not to act. They ask God to grant them. Grant them. The word means to bestow, to impart, to hand over, to entrust. Here we see they believed what they needed was grace to act in spite of danger. Do you know it takes grace to act in spite of danger? How do we want to act in the face of danger, it's time to roll. Right, let's be honest. In the face of danger, it's time to split. What they're asking is God help us not to split. Help us to act in spite of the danger. Look at the desires of the early church. Are these your desires? Their desire revealed in the request for grace to be exercised on their behalf is that they would act in courage. They're, they're saying, God, help us to be courageous. In other words, they were re re requesting that God would not allow them to be cowardly and weak-hearted when it came to the issues of the Lord. Some people think that they're being respectful by not calling others to repent and turn to the Lord. The early church thought they were being cowardly if they did that. And, and, and look at how they described themselves. <laughs> Don't miss this. You won't pray the way they prayed and you will not act the way they acted if you don't view yourself the way they viewed themselves. Look at how, look at what they, look at how they refer to themselves. They refer to themselves as bond servants. Now, you've heard me teaching this, this before. I'm not going to be here on this long. Bond servants is not a good translation. Right, right, right. Yes. This is the word doulos. And doulos means slave. Yes. Be, because of the connotations of slavery in the U.S., yeah. English translators were scared to death to translate this as it should be translated. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so they said servants. Ah. And because they wanted to make it seem a little bit better, they said bond servants. Yeah. But, th but this is not what this means. No. This is a flat out slave, y'all. Yeah. Face it. Stop running away from it. This means slave. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. This is somebody who has no authority and no right to expend their life as they saw fit, but is owned and commanded by a master. This was the early church's view of themselves. You know, we're in a culture that's all about identity today. Identity, identity, identity. Here's the Christian's identity. Here's your identity. Young people, the only identity you need to be concerned about is being a slave of God. I know the world is telling you about identity and, and, and the importance of it. The only identity that counts is being a slave of God. This is why they could pray the way they prayed. Their, their comfort was not the issue. What's, what's, what's the one thing a slave is concerned about? What the master wants done. <laughs> Keep your finger here. Look at Luke 17. Listen to Jesus talk about slaves. 
Listen to Jesus. Luke 17, 7 through 10. Watch Jesus wax eloquent here. Verse 7. But, but, which of you, but which of you, having a slave, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat, and properly clothe yourself and serve me until I have eaten and, drink, and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. Verse 9, he does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? Verse 10, so you too, put your name there, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves, we've done only that which we ought to have done. When you do the hardest thing that God tells you to do, look in the mirror and say, I'm just a worthless slave. All I did was what was commanded me to do. That's what any slave is. I mean, I haven't done anything. We want to pat ourselves in the back because we halfway stand for God in a halfway difficult situation. And we think, oh man, aren't we special? When you have done everything the master commanded you to do, say, I'm, I'm worthless. That's all I could do? Just do what he said, that's it? This is why they could pray the way they prayed. So many Believers want the benefits of being a slave of Jesus, his care and his, his watch care for his slaves, while all the while not wanting to give him what is demanded of a slave, unquestioned obedience and unquestioned compliance. When the master commands, our response is, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we immediately carry it out. Yeah. Why did the church believe that God would hear and answer their prayer? They believed it because they believed and acted as if they were Jesus' slaves, which they were. Because of that, church, in the face of the execution of the threats of the government, since they did not request for its overthrow, was that God would enable them to speak thy word with all confidence. Their prayer was that they would stand and act. Listen to this. It's not popular today. Their prayer was that they would stand and act in direct violation of their government's directive and in so doing to give complete adherence to the will of their master. Listen to their prayer. Their prayer was that they would disobey. Remember what God had told these men. He said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. The, the question before these men in Acts 4 is who are they going to obey? The government or God? Jesus did not say to be his witnesses as long as the government would allow you to be his witnesses. He gave them an unalterable command that they were under obligation to obey regardless of the circumstances in which they found themselves. So as I've been saying, the issue is not the government or its will. The issue is not about requesting that God change the government. It's about us doing what we have been commanded to do. That's our job. At the very head of the request is the phrase, with all confidence. This word confidence means freedom of speech. In, in, in the ancient world, it meant, it meant freedom of speech. And, and therefore, it was translated boldness or fearlessness. Boldness or fearlessness. Paul often asked for this in his life. Let me say something. Just because you struggle with being bold doesn't mean that you're not a good Christian. 
All of us struggle with that. I, I struggle with speaking up sometimes. As much as I'm blasting y'all. <laughs> I struggle with it. Listen to Paul. Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. Paul struggled with this. Ephesians 6. He said, and pray on my behalf. What? Paul need prayer? That the utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of, of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Why is it that we feel that as a Christian you shouldn't be afraid of anything? No one is saying don't be fearful. What we're saying is don't let the fear stop you. We're, we're going to be fearful. Should I say something? Should I not? It's going to well up in us. But we need to, we need to through, the, through the power of the Spirit, power through that. Right? right? All of us need that. Paul's concern in Ephesians 6 was that no inner emotion or disposition would get in the way of him saying what he needed, what he needed to be said. Paul, Paul would put aside any fear or feelings of shame so the gospel could go out. And we must put aside any feeling of fear or shame. And in this text, they wanted to put aside fear because th they had been threatened. They'd been threatened. So what was the validation Well that's next verse 30 but but before we get to 30 uh, I I know my time I know I'm, I'm preaching long today but just just give me a few more moments here Thank you there, there, There's there, there's an issue here that I I I just can't skip over that I that I, I want to address before I move to the, to my last two short points here in, this, here in this request, they ask that they would speak the word. Now, <laughs> the word for word here is the Greek word logos. Logos. This is the regular term used in English for our idea word, okay? Logos. Now, in some segments of the church, particularly the Word of Faith movement, the Prosperity movement, and the Charismatic movement, it is argued that Logos should be understood as referring to the written word and Rhema, as in a Rhema word, should be understood to be referring to a verbal word. They, they contrast a Logos word and a Rhema word as the difference between preaching the Bible and preaching a message sent to you from God. Now, I ran into this a few years ago. There was a, a, a lady who was coming to our church for quite some time. And um, she pulled me aside one, um, one, one uh, a Sunday morning and said that uh, she thanked me for being a part of uh, the, a church. She hadn't joined the church and she just wanted to let me know that she was leaving. Uh, but she did enjoy the church and she, and she thanked me for being here for the, moment, for the time that she was. I said, well, we're, we're, we're thankful that you, you came and we hope that you and your family were ministered to. Well, she felt she needed to explain herself why she was leaving. So she said, well, you know, I, I appreciate all, all that you've done, Pastor, and I, I appreciate how you preach, but um, I need a rhema word. I said, okay, well, that's, that's, that's good. And she wanted to go on further. <laughs> and so uh, she said, what, what, what you all do here at your church is you, you give logos words. You, you preach the Bible. And, and that, I understand, you got immature people here, that's fine. You got, you got to teach them the Bible. But uh, what I need is I need to hear from God. And so I need a rhema word. So I, I'm going to go to, uh, and she named the church, you know, you probably know, and where I can receive a rhema word. I said, okay, fine. This text is one of the many texts that proves her wrong. In this text, we have the word logos, 
which they would say is a written word, but it's used in this verse to describe a verbal word. They want to speak the word. That is defined as logos. So the, the idea that logos and rhema are two different, mean two different things is false. Yeah. They're interchangeable words in the Greek text. The separation between the so-called logos and rhema word is a false dichotomy and it's just another evidence of there being a false teacher in your midst. Or an ignorant Christian, one of the two. Get back to, back to this text. I'm, I'm almost done. This is gonna be, let me make two more points quickly. First, the request for, for validation. Verse 30, while thou dost extend thy hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of thy holy servant, Jesus. Here, they pray that God would continue the healing he has been doing and the healing and the wonders, the signs and wonders are attached to the name of Jesus. What, what they're saying here is that they understood that what God was doing was giving witness to Jesus Christ. So they asked for God to continue to give witness to Jesus Christ. But listen to what happens here. They've prayed to speak the word and for miracles. That's the stuff that got them arrested in the first place. Don't miss this. They're praying that they would continue to do and experience the very things that got them in trouble in the first place. So they are more than ready to go back to jail. Look at, look at, the, look at the confidence of these men. They're, they're praying not for their own safety. They're praying for God's will to be done. You can only do this when you, when you understand that you're a slave. If you, if you, if you think you, you're not a slave, the most important thing is, 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 is your personal safety. But when, but when you understand you're a slave, you understand, I must do the will of God, period. Yes. Because I'm a slave of God, therefore I'm under his will, not my own will. Right. And they pray again for the hand of God, that's where his power is. And they pray in, in light of Jesus as the holy servant of God. All things that we already saw. We come to the final verse, and that's the answer. Some prayers get answered immediately. <laughs> this one did, at least partially. Our text says, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. <laughs> there was a threefold answer out of, out of this prayer. First off, the time of the prayer was right away. <laughs> the answer was right away, and when they had prayed. This is followed by the first answer. The place where they had gathered together was shaken. The uh, concept of shaken was used throughout uh, the Gospels and, and, and Acts to refer both to a physical shaking as well as a, an agitation in a good or bad sense. Here, we have physical Phenomena. Now, now, they didn't pray for the place to be shaken. But that's what happened. Why? Because God was giving witness to his answer. All right? Now, we already saw this in Acts 2. In Acts 2, we had physical phenomenon. Here in Acts 4, we have physical phenomenon. This is not giving witness to the fact that every time the Spirit fills, it's going to be physical phenomenon. That's, that's the next step people are going to take. That's not the point here. Okay? This particular prayer is answered in that way. There are plenty of times when the Spirit is, is, fill, is filling and there's no shaking going on. All right, let's get that straight. So here, God gives witness to his answer. Number two, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, this is not talking about quantity. This is talking about 
control. Control. And how do we know the Spirit was controlling them? The way we know it in, throughout the, the book of Acts. And they began to speak the word of God with boldness. In spite of what it might mean for their own safety and their own well-being, their desire was answered. Boldness in proclaiming the message of God was given to the church. So this morning we have concluded Luke's first, first section of the church's growth in the face of direct opposition. The church grows in the face of direct opposition. Opposition. The first type of opposition we've studied is the opposition of human government. Although resisted by the government of men, the church will continue to share the gospel and bear witness of Jesus Christ. What will Berean do in the face of opposition? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God, for the salvation we have in him that has made us slaves. And Lord God, we look at ourselves as your slaves. Our will is not the issue. What we want is not the issue. What you want is the issue. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would live as slaves. That we would, even in the face of opposition, continue to share the gospel. Continue to serve Jesus' church. We've been called to do ministry. Shame on us that we allow the world to dictate whether we do ministry or not. Give us boldness, Lord God, to stand and to do your will, irregardless of the opposition mounted against us. Give us boldness, Lord God. I pray also for anyone in the hearing of my voice who doesn't know Christ that they would realize that, that this is not some type of trumped up boldness that they can create in themselves. You, you, you have to be given this by the Holy Spirit. And they need the Holy Spirit. And the only way to receive the Holy Spirit is by repenting from their sin and turning to Jesus Christ in faith. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they would do such a thing this day we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your hymnal. Let's turn to 5, 7,